Boy, this is like coming fast. Yeah. We're, we're live. Are we live? Oh, awesome. Uh oh. Well, we're all looking at everybody over here wondering <laughs> what's going on, and they're all got thumbs up. So, well, uh, welcome, everybody. This is our first Loophole Core Insider podcast uh, coming to you live from the SHOT Show here in, uh, here in Vegas. And uh, it's going to be a, a wild ride. Hopefully, um, you know, we won't mess up things as we go through this since it's our first one. But um, I'm Michael Wanneke, the Director of Marketing for Loophole. And with us here today, Tim Lesser, our Vice President of Product Development. We have the Mr. Professional Hunter and Extreme oh, you know, Backcountry, oh. uh, Maven uh, Randy Newberg, and uh, of course next to him, you know uh, Brian Call, Gritty Bowman Podcast. You know, very famous people. So, <laughs> <laughs> in their own mind, the bar, right? yeah, the bar's right. been set pretty yeah. high, Brian. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, we just want to remind everybody that we are live on Facebook and YouTube. So if you and we are taking questions. So if you want to go on to Facebook, the Loophole Facebook page, and uh, pull up the podcast and add your comments, so we'll, we'll see those and we'll try to answer as many as we can uh, while we have this discussion here. I think today. we've already got a uh, already got a <laughs> comment coming. I, I see that look. <laughs> hey, Brian, Brian. Uh -oh. I just like how you guys are twinning over there with I knew those it. Loophole I knew that's shirts. Where we were headed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well. <laughs> we have to sit close and, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. I, I should have know. my I, hat on. Like I actually feel left out. I, I, yeah. need, uh, I need one of those shirts. I haven't worn a collared shirt since I quit my mm. corporate job, though. Really? It's sort of like a rebellious act on my mm. part to mm. wear a T-shirt everywhere I go. Well. But I'm, I'm feeling more grown up now, more mature, and it's time. Well, I don't to know get if that's really necessary. Shirt. You, you yeah. might feel that way, but you don't behave that <laughs> way, Brian. <Yeah. laughs> don't, don't kid yourself. <laughs> so uh, today we want to talk a little bit about emerging trends. Uh, emerging trends in, in our industry as well as emerging trends outside our industry, right? Because a lot of times we're all influenced by things that happen outside the industry, and sometimes they cross over into the industry. Um, in particular, fitness is one topic that's obviously started outside the industry and has crossed over into ours. And... And, you know, within the industry, um, long-range shooting, for example, something that's really come on strong, uh, and obviously that's just another example there. So um, I think today we just want to uh, we want to sit down with, with these guys here and, and get an understanding of, you know, what these trends are, how they identify these trends, um, and, and how those trends affect, you know, what they do in their professional lives and, of course, what they do to affect us in our personal lives as well um, as we participate in this this industry that we're so passionate about. So um, uh, with that said, you know, I think, uh, you know, just generically speaking, you know, uh, how do we, how do you guys really identify some of the trends that are going on nowadays? What, do you have sources that you go to? I do. It's called my Facebook page, <laughs> my email page, and places where people will let me know if I'm not following the right trend. Oh, okay. Uh, and you get a ton of questions. I don't know about you, Brian, but I get a question overload. Uh, and Brian and I were just talking before we turned on the mic. I, I get a lot of requests on Facebook and Instagram. I don't have time to answer them all. But I, I read them because I want to see what people are talking right. about. Yep. I subscribe to a lot of industry newsletters. We come to shows like this. We get mm -hmm. to see from a product standpoint, you know, Leupold's got this new thing or that new thing. And the archery, same side. There's always this continual innovation from a product standpoint. But... Then there's the trends of how do we share information? How do we mm -hmm. research what we're doing? It's yeah. Guys I, get into fitness like him. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, I think for my, I've always been into fitness, you know, right. before just my whole life, you know, yeah. played sports in high school, played some in like intramural sports in college and I extreme sports, snowboarding, things like that, mountain biking, rock climbing, anything I could do. I've just kind of always been into that stuff. Never really good at any of it, but, you know, I'm always enjoying it. It's always part of your life. Yeah. And, but I think the, the meat, like where your food comes from, mm -hmm. is a huge emerging trend. And it's right. also, I think, tied to yep. fitness, wellness, and all of that. Sure. And I think as it relates to hunting – you know, it, it, we're we're kind of th this community is is has become the new source for organic meat. Like, if you want to eat healthy, you become a hunter. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's a trend that is kind of you see that with Joe Rogan right. uh, becoming a hunter. 
Um, Zuckerberg becoming a hunter. You know, you look at a lot. There's a, there's a number of Hollywood folks. Um, uh, Eastwood, you know, getting out and hunting. So I think, man, it's it's sort of people care about where their food comes from, right. and that trend is is a major. I mean, it's in your face everywhere you go. Yeah. And for me, I look at hunting as we we are a cross section of general society. So I look at a lot of general society trends, whether like Brian said about concern of your food or how you consume media. For me, I'm. I have multiple digital media platforms. So I'm looking to see how is the rest of society handling certain big trends? How, what, is, what is emerging? How are they using it as tools? And then try to figure out how does that apply to the world I operate in of right. hunting and conservation. Right. Because I, uh, we always say, well, us hunters, you're like we're some special microcosm. Mm. Yeah. Really, we are just like the rest yeah, of society. We regular. have people with all different perspectives, all different views, mm -hmm. all different abilities. You know, people have been doing it forever. Some are just starting. Right. So I, I think it's, uh, for me anyhow, it's effective to look at what are these things that are going on in the larger segment of society think about them, analyze them, and then say, all right, how does that apply to my world mm -hmm. of hunting and conservation? What are some trends, Randy, for you that, that have emerged in the last, let's say, five years that are particularly encouraging that, you, that you're excited about? Oh, the, the sharing of information for me. And I don't care whether it's product information. Sure. I mean, Tim, how many times do I call you or email <laughs> you, hey, out on my forum, people are asking this. And you give me the, oh. the straight scoop Which before I say something great. stupid. Yeah, we because get that there quick, as you know. quick as information gets shared, if I were to give the wrong answer, instantly it's that would there. be the right. bad the bad thing. And so for me, the sharing of information, whether it's products, whether it's ideas, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, policy about things related to hunting and conservation, I get grief all the time about. Randy, on your podcast, you're telling people how to draw all these tags. It's making it harder <laughs> for me to draw tags. Yeah. But I view all of these as useful tools. If, if we're going to make hunting, if we're going to make conservation, shooting, the things we love to right. do better and better and better, we got to look at all those tools. And right. so for me, that trend, Brian, is definitely the sharing of information in the last five years. Hmm. It is off the charts. Yeah. It is off the charts. Well, everybody is just so much. They, they just want to make their experience that much better, right? They want to be that much more efficient in whatever they do. You know, everybody's always trying to improve. I mean, you don't have to be, you know, anything special. You, you know, you. Everybody wants to fill their tag every mm -hmm. year, you know, and they're just trying to find, like, yep. if I did this, it would have been better, you know, so next year I'll do that or whatever, you know, and I think everybody's just always trying to find a way to just be more efficient and just really be able to enjoy their time out there. Uh, yeah. From Tim, <laughs> what about you? Like, what's a trend that you've you know, seen? Well, from us, obviously, clearly on the on the product side, if I'm looking at it that way, right? So from with my, my uh, product development hat on, mm -hmm. the biggest thing is long range. It's been around... Um, and, you know, to be perfectly honest, there, there are ways to get, I think, a little bit on the wrong side of the ethics there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not up to us to define what that is, but we've definitely seen, if you want to call it five years, it's exploded. But it, it had been creeping for a while, this long-range shooting, but, but more importantly, the long-range hunting. We're seeing a lot yeah. of that, where guys are um, trying to really push the limits on how far they're shooting it. it at game animals um, and so for us that that the biggest trend in the industry um, as a manufacturer is w where do we stand on this mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. yeah not necessarily trying to get into the political side of it but um, we've got to stand somewhere right. because these you know the, there is an ethical side of this so we can make gear that will do amazing things that that mark five that's sitting right there we just thought out to shot out to three thousand yards yesterday Wow. Right, and um, winds get tricky and other things. So uh, the products are, are capable of doing this, but for us, the biggest trend is, is where, where does hunting end and shooting begin if you're on the rifle side? You know, obviously you're, you do a lot of um, archery hunting. And, right. But you, you reach it there too. How far do you want right. to fling an arrow before that, 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 uh, that well, critter is going to take a step yeah, like mid-flight? Five years ago, I remember hearing a six or 700-yard shot, and people would be like, whoa, wow, what a shot. Yeah. Now, now people are shooting 1,400, yeah. 1,500 yards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and pretty regularly. And, yeah. and the reality is that technology is, is increasing 
rapidly. Right. Like the the gear we have right now and the apps on your phone, like mm -hmm. all, all that stuff that goes into making a long range shot is like achievable by everyone. If they buy the right gear, get mm -hmm. some experience, they, uh, they can do things that, you know, they wouldn't have been able to do five years ago. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. Speak so. for yourself. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's an interesting topic because, you know, um, in, in, um, I, I don't hear, because I'm primarily in, on the side of archery, right? right? So I, I yeah. mostly spend my time archery hunting, do a couple of rifle hunts a year. On the archery side of things, um, you, there's, there's deep debate on how much technology is too much technology. Sure. Right? Because the whole idea of shooting a bow is that it's primitive, in nature right. you're you're going back to you're making it pr you're purposely making it more difficult right but there's nothing primitive about a modern rec compound bow <laughs> like no. right between arrows you know lighted knocks sights like everything is advanced yeah. um i mean f now guys are regularly shooting out to 100 yards mm -hmm. with accuracy that they could never have achieved five you know 10 years ago especially yeah so the technology is changing fast, which allows us, in most cases, to expand our our shooting distance. Right, right. Whether yeah. it's rifle or or bow, and um, in that bow hunting community, there's there's an extreme. Whenever new, there's a whole camp of individuals freaking out. Like Garmin came out with that new zero sight, sure. where it it'll it's it's so advanced. Of beyond whatever everything else that's out there, yep. right? So you pull the side up. It uh, you can, it's a rangefinder mm -hmm. mounted to the bow. Basically, it calculates the exact yardage to your target. It actually lights up the pin for, for the exact yeah, yardage that yeah, you all need digitally. To, yep. All yep. digital. Everything is boom. Like all you do is aim, and and uh, it your sights dialed. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so. No need to fiddle with a rangefinder, pull it out of your pocket. No, no need to adjust a sliding sight. Like everything is right there, right. and uh, but it's an electronic device being mounted to your bow. Yeah, and um, and so there's a there's a a whole discussion about is this appropriate? Have we gone too far? What will this do in terms of uh, harvest statistics? And are we getting away from what you know hunting is supposed to be about right. at this mm -hmm. point? Mm -hmm. And um, so my, my, I have, that, I, you know, that's a question I have. I, I've, I've, I think about it often. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, my personal feelings on technology, um, and and it's ever changing, uh, and uh, it, it it often conflicts with other other hunters' views on technology. Right, right. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. very curious <laughs> what Randy thinks about this. What's what's too much? Yeah, is well. there too much? Brian's trying to get me in trouble here, and I don't want to ruin the Leupold brand in two sentences. Uh, I'll just say when you, I, I'm probably older than any two of you combined here. So when you get old or older, you, you go through this morphing of your hunting, uh, what, what you take from it, what satisfies you, what gratifications you get. And I'm like retro now. I, it's about getting close. I mean, yeah. I went to Utah two years ago and I filmed this archery mule deer hunt. And it was, I, these were really, really big mule deer. I saw two bucks in seven days. It was that, th that tough of a hunt. But it was about getting close. Yep. And so when the film comes out, it's called Close. Unfortunately, mm. even as close as I got, I managed to shoot an arrow right <laughs> over the back <laughs> over the of both of them. <laughs> but... That was probably the most gratifying hunt I had that entire season because I said, this is what I want out of this experience. Right. Yeah. I, it's yep. not about, oh, I got to shoot this or I got to shoot that. Because when you get to a certain point, and we're lucky, Brian, you and I, we get to hunt a lot. Yep. And I tell people, if I never shoot another animal, I've shot more than my share. And now I want something that gives me purpose and a sense of accomplishment and that's not about how far the shot is and you know you guys send me the most unbelievable equipment and say randy go use this abuse it try to break it whatever give us feedback and i'm probably not pushing it anywhere near what you guys have designed it for mm. because 
I, you know, you give me a Mark Five or a, a VX5 HD, three to fifteen with the CDS system. Mm -hmm. I, I keep most of my rifle shots under 300 yards. Well, right. that's not even getting started <laughs> yeah, right. with that system. Yeah. I shoot a 308 as my favorite cartridge. Well, you got guys with, you know, 338 Lapuas with whatever, and they look at me with my little old 308 out there. I feel like I went to Indy with a, a Ford Pinto <laughs> or something. <laughs> right. You know? right. And right. Uh, so I think part of my perspective on technology, whether it's archery, influenced by the fact that now that I've, I've been in this hunting gig for 40 years. I'm really looking for a different uh, experience, a, a experience mm -hmm. that where the technology is of that advances or increases effective range that yeah. you can do mm -hmm. is not as important to me as technology that works, that's right. reliable, that's mm -hmm. durable, that's not going to fail, mm -hmm. and serves my purpose. So, yeah, I. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm in the same boat as you, but I I think that's kind of the natural evolution of a hunter in I, some I ways is yeah. is you may not start out um, with that uh, you know at, at first I remember shooting an, uh, an elk with a rifle for the first time that was uh, that was a very to me um, now looking back it's like it's like a fail proof hunt. Like, if I went out on that hunt again, there's no way I'm not killing anything. Right. Back then, though, it was a big, giant question mark. Right. Maybe I'll be lucky. Maybe I won't, you know. Because of my experience level, what I knew about elk, what I knew about the outdoors, what I knew about shooting, mm -hmm. like, it was. So, I think um, there's a couple things. Some guys are not super fit, right? Right. But. I have seen some 300 dudes shoot their lights out with a bow and arrow. Right. Like 100, 120 yards. Like yeah. just drill. Like they're, they're, they're lights out. They're amazing. Yeah. But they're not sneaky. You know, they're mm -hmm. not sneaky or fit, right? But they're t I couldn't I, – and I cannot shoot like them. I mean, I can't. Yeah. So I kind of feel like everybody has their, their skill set. And what gets them excited and what they love to do. Right. And if a guy is really talented and, and his thing is being able to shoot an, a, a compound bow, you know, 100 yards with perfection, man, more power to that guy to use that lethality, his skill set, mm -hmm. to capitalize on his hunt, how he wants to capitalize on it. Right. For me, I can't shoot like that. Yeah. Yeah. I can't. And it's not really what gets me excited either. So getting to within you know 40 to 30 yards of an animal that's bedded and getting getting a shot off that right. for me is what it's all about uh and so that's my skill set i'm kind of naturally good in that area like i got sneaky feet i can get close exactly that's, that's and so for me that's that's what i want to do maybe if i could actually shoot well at to 100 <laughs> i might like have a different idea but my point is i i'm kind of libertarian when it comes to the technology debate yeah. let people choose what they will use yeah it's their choice right um yep. and then and then i'll celebrate that as long as it's ethical and and they're and and and, and fair to the animal um as long as that technology doesn't have a negative ecological impact right i'm mm. i'm pretty much you know good with technology some some of the best shooters I know are out at my home range in Bozeman, Montana, and I go out there and I cannot believe how capable they are under some of the craziest conditions of atmospheric conditions, mm -hmm. of wind, of mm -hmm. whatever. And I'm just watching them. I'm don't don't. I mean, they just it's got like, it you dialed it? in. Yeah. But those guys, I know them very well. Every one of them say, you know what? When I'm hunting. It's 400 yards or less or 300 yards mm -hmm. or less. They say, I, I, I can come out here and bang steel all day long yeah. and prove that I've got this great stuff like we see right. on the table mm -hmm. here. But when I'm hunting, it's different. I have a lot of respect for those guys. They, they, they can do it. They, yeah. they, their skill set is extreme. But when it comes to hunting, they make the conscious choice of, I'm not going to do that mm -hmm. because as the one guy told me, he said, as much as all this great technology, all this new powder, all these new things are now available to me, he said, 
the weather and the animal has not changed. Yeah. The, the conditions, mm, right. the, the heartbeat, the excitement. He said, those are things that will always be the same, and those are variables I can't control. Yeah. So, true. Yeah. I think like anybody, you know, they, it's a confidence builder, you know, like you, whether it's archery or rifle hunting, right? So archery, if you practice out to 100, when you take that 40, 50-yard shot, you have that much more confidence, right? And yeah. same thing with shooting, right? You might be shooting steel out past 1,000, but you know that you're going to, you want to shoot 400 or less. But when you do have to do that, you feel really good about that shot. And yeah. you're not all kind of like, you know, jittery and, and yeah. blow the opportunity. With, with archery and like rifle, you're, I'm, I'm always trying to f- achieve that surprise release. Right. You know, right. Like, like the, it goes, the bow, it, it fires the arrow and I don't, I don't, I don't know don't quite know. when it's going to go off. Right. Yep. And, um, and that's tricky. And, and I found, I've said this before on Gritty Bowman, like all, before I went into the season, I was drilling this elk target at, the archer range at 107 yards with broadheads and grouping like six seven arrows in a row like right in the kill zone i'm like wow you know no wind no adrenaline not nervous on a range everything's set it's yeah. perfect right and i'm hitting it well i've come to the realization that <laughs> when i'm killing an animal when i'm in that moment <laughs> none of that exists dude, my adrenaline is <laughs> insane yeah. like i get so jacked and pumped yeah. in that moment that um I have to be, I you know I got to be really close. Yeah, yeah. Because just the adrenaline and my own body's physics and and what happens to me with the shakes and everything mm-hmm. else. Yeah. I I can't execute that shot. Yeah. yeah. Even though I can do it in these perfect conditions, it's not even close to reality. Right. And then you add in the animal moves and the wind and all of that. And I do think that with the advent of technology, that that I. Going into the season, I thought I was much more capable than I was in a live animal situation. I, ex- to, I, I took away from the season some experiences where I'm like, nope, from now on, I'm, I know what my effective range is under these conditions. Right. right. Under, mm-hmm. And now I've capped it at XYZ range, you yeah. know, right around 50 yards. I feel really confident. Right. Anything over that, and I'm starting to feel like there's more variables. There's just a lot of variables. Yeah. yeah. And uh, didn't go into the season with that at all mm-hmm. in fact uh, i shot a bull elk at like 75 70 something around that yards and i nailed it you know and it was a great shot i was really calm mm-hmm. for some reason mm-hmm. but then there were a few other opportunities later where i'm like i was not calm mm-hmm. <laughs> you did not have the same serene <laughs> yeah. feeling and uh yeah. that shot now you know i just am like look you just got to get closer yeah and that's not necessarily a fitness thing either, you know, that adrenaline rush. You no. know, you could be the most fit yeah, person can. or you could be the most unfit person, and it's going to affect you differently. You I know? cannot I figure know. out how to fix that. Yeah. And it, I don't necessarily want to. Yeah. No. No, no, when that goes away, man, hang it up. You're right. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. That's, that's, I mean, there's what, something that's what we're out there for. Primal when, in yeah. your when DNA are, that kicks on. When we're filming for TV, Tim, you know this, you've been on our show, we have what's called lav mics, and they get stuck. We Yeah put them right here to block the wind right well if you turn up the audio most times on <laughs> whoever the shooter is you hear that heart and uh <laughs> we we had a, a guy a good friend he was in uh, nevada this year and he was stalking on a on an antelope that we'd been hunting and it's big i mean it, it officially made the record book and it was so funny when we were editing i'm like what's that noise it's like boom, 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 boom. <laughs> yeah. it's mike's heart and uh that that that's the element that none of us will i, well, I hope we can never never change that yeah, element never yeah. grow tired of that when, when you hunt with a new hunter you'll see this where a new hunter will go out and you know, like i bring a buddy along for the first time he's never actually had an animal walk in front of him in shooting range with a weapon before with the intent of killing it right that moment comes and most of the time unless they have some kind of previous experience under pressure most of the time um the shot goes off and they were nowhere near the target like they missed they completely black out <laughs> right. like okay well, well well where did you aim and, and where did the arrow go i have no idea yeah like just not blank blanked out yeah. blanked out and yeah. so i think you know you see that with new hunters where the the nerves are so intense and then they walk away from that thinking going i never expected to feel that way at mm-hmm. all like what just happened mm-hmm. and i think it's very very primal like yeah. It's deep inside yep. our, the human DNA to, to in that moment. It's like it's not like 
hardly any other experiences uh, you yeah. can have. Well, on that topic, you know, we, we got a question from Skip here. It says, I've noticed a lot more people getting into the uh, hunting fitness trend. You know, the, the mm -hmm. common question, uh, what do you guys do to stay fit and to prepare yourself for that? And I know it's going to be a variety of different answers. <laughs> <laughs> Dairy Queen and fitness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I drive a desk we for a living. This. Yeah. I, you know, I, my other life, I'm a CPA. I disinherit the federal <laughs> treasury is how I make my real living. And that requires driving a desk. Right. And then you got guys like Brian who... Part of the reason I've really got on this Dairy Queen ice cream <laughs> kick is Brian had me on his podcast, and we got on this topic about fitness. I felt like you may as well ask me to teach Mandarin Chinese or something. I don't know anything about fitness. Mm. Yeah. I got a trail out my back door that will take me all the way to Yellowstone Park if I want. I throw my pack on, and if I want to really go and get some cardio, I truck it build at faster. a faster pace right, yep. right if i want to build core strength i go off the trail and i put a heavy load on and uh, that's yeah <laughs> the, that's all i do yeah. and then you got guys like him who, who it's it's part of their process of getting ready for the season and, and getting yeah it. yeah fitness whether i um hunt it or not yeah so for me it's just life yeah exactly uh a uh, couple of things though that i think are really important and that's for everyone regardless of age but especially as you get older i think cl diet is huge um metabolism changes and everything yeah like that, i think yeah. you have to eat uh really like healthy meats and fats animal fats and meat I'm, I'm real big into like a ancestral type diet like a native like a primal diet where you're kind of eating natural fish you know, fish oils, you know, you're, you're eating all these different fish. You're eating your, your deer and your elk and, and your antelope and all of that because I know you like antelope, Randy. So you're eating all of that. Dry. And then you're eating, like, legit vegetables and, and, and low-sugar fruits, lots of fiber. Mm -hmm. And you're eating as much green veggies as you can. I think when you're eating like that, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people are like, what? I give up my French fries and my burger and my soda? It's pretty tough. But the way you feel and, and your taste buds change over mm -hmm. time right. to where I can't really eat foods that are all around here in Vegas. Like, yeah. oh. I'm, I'm really picky. So I bring a lot of foods with me that I like to eat because yeah. I like to stay lean and healthy. So right. I think that eating is, is important. And that goes right into these emerging trends, you know, um, getting your food from the right, right place, eating well is just like, you can't emphasize it enough. And it really... It, it ties in so well with hunting because that's what we're doing. We're finding food in its most natural form, right. bringing it home, harvesting it, find different ways to prepare it, cook it. It's just, it's an awesome lifestyle to have. Yeah. And then the other part I think that's, that's really overlooked is lifting heavy weight. You know, I think as people get older, they lose muscle mass quickly. They lose bone density. Their, their connective tissues are what break down. It's like, oh, my knee hurts, my hip hurts, my back hurts. You know, it's all of these kind mm -hmm. of things that I think really shut people down. So, you know, doing things like deadlift and squats, mm -hmm. um, you know, with a barbell right. are pretty. Yeah, they're just oh, they're just by the by the by mainstream folks that aren't really into fitness. I think they really miss out on the benefits of that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. And then uh, you and then just climbing stairs with yeah. a backpack on right. see that and that's huge it's, right you know whether it's stairs or a mountain but climbing up up and down with a heavy with with a 30 or 40 pound pack you right. start out light but move up to that and you do that for 20 minutes yeah i, d I, I typically do cardio for time yeah not for distance and everything mm -hmm. so i want to get my heart rate up a little bit and i want to go 20 minimum of 20 minutes and then other days i'll go 40 six up right. till Till I'm putting in more just yeah. elevated cardio, not super fast, yeah. not super hard. But, and I say to people, go for time. I got to make it five miles or I got to make it one. Mm -hmm. Right. Go for time. Go for five minutes and then you're done. You know, and the next yeah. week, go for 10. Yeah. Especially if you haven't done it in a long time. Right. And then, and then go for time. Don't go for speed, anything. Then later, as you start to feel good, because you won't feel good at <laughs> first. It's yeah. not fun at yeah. first. Your body will rebel at yeah. every turn. Then, then work your way up to other things when you mm -hmm. feel like it. Yeah. But at the beginning, just go, go, go move your body for five minutes. 
10 minutes. <laughs> Start you know, sooner it, it, rather than it, later. Well, it's an interesting point, right? Because so I had a couple of advantages, three um, that I don't have now. One was I lived in Wyoming, mm -hmm. so I was at elevation, right? So I lived at seventy three hundred feet. I just I didn't know what it was like to run out of oxygen because <laughs> we never had any. Right. Yeah. Um, two, I was I was younger, um, and three, I was a guide, so I was out carrying stuff. All it was natural, normal things. Now I've you know gone to Oregon. I, I, we're almost below sea level where we where we live there and uh, trying right. to train you know if i'm going to go with one of you guys on a trip it it starts earlier for me i fitness is a is a way of life for me mm -hmm. yeah. but training for elevation and and like an elk hunt um, in new mexico is not easy to do when your house is at 43 feet yeah. above sea level it's not <laughs> easy to do and um, mm -hmm. what, what i've found i've tried different things various various ways and what i've found is is exactly what you said about the pack so i i Working out is something I'm going to do either way, squats and, and you yeah. know, bench and some of those things just to, to keep things moving. But in order to get my lung power, I noticed I, st I did exactly that. Started with a 15, maybe 20-pound pack. just depends on your, your comfort level. Mm -hmm. But I would go, for me, I set to, you know, the, the stair stepper to a, a level of where I would go 100 flights. In yeah. Like a lot. But it's just a half an hour. Watch a sitcom on yeah. it while you're yeah. going, right? Um, Listen and then to I would, a podcast. And then I, yeah. Like Hunt Talk Radio. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Loophole's Hunt the Talk the Radio. Pros. Um, is, it, is it Loophole's Gritty Bowman? Uh-uh. Oh. But it's still, they're, they're, they got a special place in my heart. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what, what I noticed was the, I was getting stronger, but the lung power. So if I went from 20 pounds to 25, boy, that first one the next week, I was lit up. My lungs were, mm -hmm. I noticed it. By the end of that, um, I was up to 45 pounds, in, which isn't heavy compared to a quarter of an elk or anything else. But when I got out there, I actually stood a chance to yeah. keep up and, there, and do these things. And to that point, Tim, if there's one thing about the traveling hunter, especially elk hunters, if you're coming from the Midwest, if you can give yourself a day or two to acclimate to right. the altitude. I, if you've never had altitude sickness, you've never been miserable well, <laughs> if you have had altitude sickness you know what misery yeah. is mm -hmm. and and i think it, people who get off the plane drive out to the trailhead and say oh, i'm gonna get after it they're good for about one good hike and then they're done then they're out and yeah. so even if you don't have a chance to train at high elevation do all that you can and when you get there give yourself a day or two before you really push it before yeah. you really get and, after and it. And I want to say, you know, if you're just you're climbing, climbing is good, like right. upstairs or just the stair sure. stepper or, or treadmill on an incline, but a mountain is even better. And if you can, wear the boots you're going to wear when you hike. Yeah. Put them on and use them um, because you need to toughen up those feet. They need to get worked in. They need to get set up and those boots become like something tight so so I, you got another i was going to switch gears Michael. i was going to yeah. switch back to uh to a little bit to technology kyle writes in he says as a new hunter how much should i invest in technology or slash gadgets you know so <laughs> so already he's a little bit leery of uh, uh, some of the technology i think yeah based on well that. i made that mistake when i started elk hunting so i grew up in minnesota moved out west i was a whitetail hunter and I struggled to understand elk hunting because I didn't know anything about elk themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. And my first six seasons, I never released an arrow. I never fired a shot at an elk. And a lot of people are like, you're out giving elk hunting seminars. You mean <laughs> it took you six years to figure this out? Yes, it Trial did. Trial and error. <laughs> and so what, all the gadgetry or whatever term that, that he used there, there is worthwhile equipment that you want to invest in, but don't think that any equipment is a shortcut for understanding the species you're right. hunting. And we get into this all the time about the five seasons of elk. You got early season, pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut, late season. And the reason I break it out that way is where you find elk in August is way different than you find them in October or November. Mm -hmm. right? Where they're at in the peak rut of September, they're going to be somewhere else in December. Understand what elk need at the time of year you're hunting them, and that's where you'll find them. And that requires investing in yourself, investing in your knowledge base about the species you're hunting. 
you you can have the greatest of everything clothes packs boots with a rifle that shoots from here to mars whatever if you can't find them yeah none of that stuff does you any good and yeah, so to, to that person's question i would say invest in product that's the sure. quality product but don't think that just because you spent more than you needed to somehow that gets you your elk or your deer yeah, yeah. No. I would say that um, there's some gear that I highly recommend, you know, for everyone when they're starting out. Yeah. Um, and that is good boots, a good pack, yeah. and good clothing. Yeah. yeah. Because those three things will keep you in the hills. We'll and keep, you the mountains. Mountains. keep you right. out there. Keep you out there. Right. Um, if your boots, you get blisters or they're, they're wet or they're, you're miserable, you, you stop. Mm -hmm. Hunting's not fun. Hunting's not fun. Being outdoors is not fun when you're cold and wet and miserable. Mm -hmm. So if you can, if you can, you know, work on those three things, like, like I said, boots, pack, and, and some clothing, then you can have a really great experience out there in a crummy tent yeah. with an average, you know, sleeping bag and right. pad with a really cheap bow or yeah. rifle, yeah. scope. You, you just don't, like, those things aren't as critical to me. Yeah. Later, you know, when you get further along, you can you can um, increase in that. And for me, like, guys will ask me, should I get a new bow? And I'm like, well, <clears throat> you know, and Hoyt might not like this, but I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> if you have a bow right now, you only need it for that one shot. Right. Right? Like, you're just shooting it for that, that one moment where, you're, where you get on the animal. I mean, yes, you're practicing with it, but... Um, you know they're all so good nowadays mm -hmm. that that you can and same with guns and rifles right. and scopes it's like you can run whatever for me the only time i'm like i'm i want a new bow because i i'm like every human uh i once i get a new <laughs> toy i actually practice more yeah right like you're Reminder. out there excited to shoot it because yeah. it's yeah. it's new mm -hmm. yeah. but but in general no i don't think you need to spend a lot of money i'd rather see a guy spend his money on a trip to Alaska or Prince of Wales Island or out, out west to hunt elk, spend your money there and have some minimal gear. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I look at how, and, and this is a kind of an emerging trend, but also to this person's question, we've benefited a lot from how what our military is doing to what we get to use absolutely. in the field. From, from products you guys yep. build, from clothing mm -hmm. to packs. I mean, the pack company I use, they're primarily a military pack company, <laughs> and they've adapted it to the hunting needs. Right. And so what somebody can get for a very good price, what's the new VX uh, that you guys just released this week? VX Freedom. Freedom. The Freedom there. Yeah. That, uh, you think about what quality mm -hmm. that, that product right there represents at that price point. That's unbelievable quality compared to what we had... You oh, know, yeah. you compare For this to, to, to what, what you were start. getting yeah. 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, an emerging trend is, you know, this is an example. Amazing technology that's brought into almost, I don't know if this is entry level, but it is. It's, <laughs> it's going to it's gonna last forever. Yeah. Right. I mean, so. And, and so for that person who's on, the, you know, they're just starting in the budget is right. the concern. This is an investment. It's not an expense. It's not something you're going to throw away after two or three years. It's right. going to serve you well forever. <clears throat> and the the emerging trend of all these new ideas coming to us as consumers in the hunting world that came from military or mm -hmm. uh, you know other industries, I I would tell the person buy good, make it and know that it's an mm -hmm. investment. Like Brian said, yeah. clothing and stuff like that. Boots. Yep. But don't don't go overboard. Don't don't go buy gadgets because you think it's a shortcut. Right. Randy, do you do you put more value on on durability than you do performance? Like in terms of uh, you know, I they're equal. I got to have both. I, I'm not, you know, if something is you know super, perform super high, but it's like a little China doll that's going to break, mm -hmm. that, that doesn't mean no good. Or if something that built like a lead pipe but doesn't perform that well yeah so for me it's trying to marry those are the two things i'm not compromising on i i would say like with a bow i'm in, in an arrow setup you know i'm i'm much more concerned now with fail proof 
a fail-proof system that I can drop that bow on the ground. Or I can yeah. knock it into trees. I can actually drop it in a river and pick it up, and everything still works. Or it can right. freeze solid in the night and then unthaw in the day and, like, actually yeah. still everything stays tuned. And, and yeah. that, to me, is far more important now than whether or not, <clears throat> you know, the draw cycle's perfect or something right. like that. Um, so I, as I go to purchase stuff, I want it to be pretty much bomb proof oh, as yeah. much as possible because I often backpack in really far or I get very remote That's, and yep. you know you get 12 miles into some place and and we're, we were at 12,000 feet this year hunting elk I don't I don't want to go I don't to pack out of there with because your bow had some like tweak on it right yep. and go get it fixed and come back and when, especially when a lot of people just take a week off of vacation right. time. That's valuable. You need that equipment to work. Yeah. You know, yeah. you need your binos, your your range finder. You need that stuff to just work. You can't right. be having having issues with it. So right. when it comes to gear, I'm much more interested in its durability than maybe mm-hmm. it, than maybe that it performs perfectly. Well, mm-hmm. that you know that it's interesting. Cause I've got kids that are that are at the right age now, where where we're kind of doing some of this exact thing. What what do we? pick and choose first and Brian you're exactly right if those kids it's western Oregon mm-hmm. there's three days of sunshine a year and, and they're usually during the <laughs> week so you're, you're at, at the office mm-hmm. and uh, you know taking them out for blacktail or, or for Roosevelt elk is a is a challenge because yeah. it's it's big country it's steep and it's always wet right mm-hmm. so you know it, it depends this the question on on how much do you invest in gear or gadgets I think it really comes down to the line between is it gear or gadget right and that's a good way to put it and uh you know for me once we got through i went in that order i went boots rain gear yeah then better gear Uh, you know you can put on some some rubber suit if you have to that'll at least it keeps you dry yeah and then right after that now you're able to stay out there so your gear had better perform and yeah. um, you know what made it or made it or, or broke it for my daughter, which you know we're talking about these these trends and, and increased in female participation, right? Yeah. My wife and my daughter spend as much or more time out there than I do, but on my daughter's first deer that she'd done all by herself, I I, I got to tell you it's the, the CDS style. It's not a it's not a shameless plug here. That was the one piece of kit that made the difference, yeah. Yeah. because it was it was a known distance. Um, but it was farther than she had shot. And, and so this long range hunting thing, you know, did, was it a thousand yards? No, it was 326 yards, right? which I know is in her skill set and that she's capable of doing that. But if she'd have just needed to hold, pull up and guess, I need to hold on the top of this deer's back. She was too jacked. You know, that, that, that adrenaline that you're talking about, mm-hmm. um, had kicked in and we spent 25 minutes of me like, take a deep breath. Take, are you ready? Are you steady? Nope. This is he's he's in his bed just wait yeah just wait you know wait till you're ready but that in that particular case having the right gear rather than gadget did make a, a difference she had the right the right boots you know we're big as as adult and, and as males I, I think we don't get it as cold as easy uh, yeah right mm-hmm. and so i take for granted that i can sit out there a little bit cold on the side of a hillside because i know there's going to be a deer maybe right I try telling that to a you know a nine or ten year old kid that doesn't want to be that's bored. I'm bored. Mm-hmm. What do you mean there might be something? Where is it? Come on. I got video yeah. games. Run one by. I just push a button on this thing. <laughs> right. You know, and, and right. so I go for, for me personally, with the with the new, the newer folks, whether they're kids, women, or adults, get them the right gear so they're comfortable and enjoy being out there. C- focus on the yeah. body. Then focus on once you've stayed out there I long agree. enough to be successful, have the right kit that is reliable to help you do that. That's yeah. kind of, that's where I would stand at least. Yeah. 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 You gotta overcome the the mental side of it, right? You know, if you're not right in the head and, you, and your your mind's saying you're miserable, you're not comfortable, get out. You it's, know. And Tim, you bring up a good point with kids because <clears throat> we already have the addiction, the obsession mm-hmm. with hunting, right? So I can get wet to the bone and still want to stay in 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 the stand or in the woods for that moment, right? If you don't have the obsession. You no, you you're, not, you're yeah. not into the pain. You're not into yeah. the misery. You're yeah. not willing to suffer through it to get to the to the prize at the end. Yeah. So that like with kids and and especially new hunters, I'm like, dude them up, get them as you know yeah. decked out as you can. Get invest in that stuff so you're warm and comfortable, so that you can endure and enjoy the process until you get the obsession. 
then when you get the obsession, you know, you're willing to do all kinds of stupid yeah. things. You can you can make anything work. <laughs> yeah. Then. Yeah. It's like, well, I forgot my boots. Right. I'll be quieter. <laughs> watch this. That's <laughs> right. Silver exactly. lining. Watch how quiet. I'm uh, stealthy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah questions wait, there, Mike? Well, I got another question here. Now, you touched on it a little bit with the VX Freedom, but Daniel's saying, I'm looking for a new hunting scope. What's new this year? You know, and I'm sure that uh, we've got a couple options, obviously, here on the table, but uh, not – always just hunting related but uh, give an update on some of the new things that yeah so you know in terms of, of hunting scopes the vx freedom is probably the the newest that we have here but it really depends on on where you're going to use it how you're going to use it you know so one of the most common questions that we get is i have a 30-06 what scope do i need right what i what i really need to know is what are you trying to do where are you going how are you hunting and brian what do you, you looks like you've got a yeah, I got it. Uh, so I, uh, on this note, let's pretend that you're on Prince of Wales Island and okay. there's lots of fog and it's pouring rain, right? And I'm trying to look through a scope. How, mm. how, what scope and how do I set that up? Okay. You know, I'm not probably going to be shooting more than 200 yards, maybe three. But but I want but basically I want to be able to see through it. Do you want to be so so <laughs> one of, one in of horrible odd. horrible <laughs> conditions? <laughs> yeah. So do you want to know what's on my rifle that I take to Prince of Wales? Yeah, I have two. I have a, a, a VX6 that is a two to twelve. Really? Yeah. I, in a place like Prince of Wales, a three hundred yard shot is like oh that must be down along the beach because there's <laughs> you're you're no place you're going to see three hundred yards. Right. It's bomb proof. It's, uh, you know, with the CDS system, it is as easy to use. And I don't need that high-end magnification for a place like that. Mm -hmm. Now, when I go to Wyoming pronghorn hunting, I got a VX5 3 to 15. Yeah, so, to your point, Tim, it depends on it, what your application is. Right. And, and, so. and I would go versatile. You know, something like that 3 to 15 gets down low enough that you can hunt brush. Mm -hmm. But if you need to take a, a longer shot on, on antelope or... Um, or whatever it is, even even predators or other mm. things, you can get up to 15. But to your point, mm -hmm. one of the, one of the things I don't think a lot of people are aware of, you're on, you're it's foggy, it's rainy, and typically when it's foggy and rainy, that means you're warm and sweaty if you're moving at all. You yeah. just it's it it just is what it is. Yeah. Um, a, a scope can be as waterproof, I mean submergible, and and we build these things so that that you can swim out of torpedo tubes at 66 feet and surface and have them work fine. There's there's folks that do that, and I'm glad that they do, um, on our side. But it can be that waterproof, and you get in that environment, and they will fog up on the outside if you don't have the proper types of coatings and, and hydrophobic stuff. So honestly, for that, if I'm looking at exactly what you're talking about, mm -hmm. I'm going either the 2-12 to 12 VX6 or uh, HD or the VX5 HD. We've got in that in the hard coat, so it's not something that we spray on or anything. It's, it's actually in the hard coating on the lenses is a hydrophobic coating. We call it Guardian. Um, and mm -hmm. It's nice if you're in Wyoming because it keeps dust and fingerprints off. But I can fix that, right? right. When, it's, when it's time to take a shot, if it's not quite as, you know, there's a little bit of dust on the objective, you still see through it. Yeah, yeah. Um, up up there, Western Oregon, right, is, it's is, been a problem is similar. for me at times. And so you even breathe anywhere even near that scope, and it fogs on the outside. On the surface, yeah. And you try to wipe it off, and the scope is sealed. But that's, that's a nightmare. It is, and it's hard to get rid of. There, there are other ways to get rid of that if you've got a scope and it's doing that, and you're not going to go buy a, a brand new one just to, to fix it, mm -hmm. there are lens cleaners that you can put on. You can breathe directly on the lens, and it won't fog up. Mm. He's, so th that's, okay. a, another, that's a little piece of... of an, an, extra, an extra coating there that will prevent that. that You can breathe right on it, right? Now, and it won't let the water... That's what I need. ...condense. <clears throat> Back to bomb proof. Yeah. You know, just mm -hmm. I need... Because uh, I beat the crap out of my stuff. I, I just I use it and abuse it hard. Well, it's, o it's, it's always lovely to treat them nice and you take them to the range and they're in these nice, you know, soft cases. And then you get up there and Randy takes you across some kind of a rock <laughs> slide at 12.5. Right. And you've got about 32 seconds before those bulls are going to hit the timber, which, by the way, they're out of sight on the other side of the ridge. So you better yeah. get to moving. And 
you have just come from a desk at 52 feet above sea level. <laughs> Pretty soon, the equipment becomes a tool. And yeah. I'm, uh, that rifle it's an arrest becomes system. a crutch and a rest and, and <laughs> helps me stretch out my lower back and all kinds uh. of stuff. And, uh, and then you get there, and there's a few more love, <clears throat> love marks on the, the rifle stock and the scope. Yeah. And, boy, it better still be on, right? You've just yeah. done all of that. And the bomb-proof piece, a, a, a lifetime warranty doesn't do you any good when you miss that shot. That's no. why you need the lifetime guarantee, right? You need, you need guaranteed to perform, right. not warranted to be replaced. Yeah, yeah. that's the part that just, I, I want it to be on, like I said, in that moment of truth, I need it to work. Right. And I don't yep. care about that I can replace it later. Like I need it to work now. Yeah. <laughs> right now. Right I, now, at this point. For me, there is always enough going on but and obviously filming that's the whole other level the last thing i want to do is have some tickling little feeling in the back of my mind that i wonder if this piece of equipment's going to perform <laughs> right yeah i and whether it's my bow or my rifle <coughs> i need to know and have confidence that that product that item is so much more qualified mm -hmm. and capable than I am that it never right. enters my mind at that about moment it. Yeah. of truth. That's where, like, this rangefinder, Leupold's rangefinder, is, yeah. you know, the calculations are incredible, but I can get the range quickly. I can actually get a range That's in the, the range, piece, right? in the nasty stuff. The yeah, and, I mean, <clears throat> I had another brand one in my pocket, and it was uh, Rivers West clothing. Right. And uh, I was hunting blacktails, and there's a flap that goes over in the cargo pocket, and the flap had been tucked in. And so the pocket filled up with about three or four inches of water. <laughs> Rangefinder was toast. I've since <laughs> tested that with the Leupold. It works just fine. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, that matters, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I don't care, you know, how it performs otherwise if it can't take a beating. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, it's important to us. Um, you know, our, one of our, our founders, that, that's – the customer's always entitled to a square deal. This was Roosevelt era, and you, you can feel mm -hmm. it in some of the heritage. But those those hills where we are, you know, Oregon's a very diverse state. We've got more species of North American game than anywhere besides British Columbia, and that's just because they have one extra moose that we don't have. Yeah. yeah. So you can hunt everything from bighorn, you know, so, so California bighorn to, to Rocky Mountain bighorn to goats to moose to... And then you get out and you've got all the, the soggy stuff, too. Well, yep. unfortunately, that's where we live, is the soggy side where you get webbed toes and, <laughs> and everything else. And that's where the stuff was founded. It's steep. Mm -hmm. It's slick. Yep. It's always roughly 45 degrees and pouring. It's a lot like Alaska. It's very similar to southeast Alaska mm -hmm. yeah. without the, uh, the better bears and some of that stuff. <laughs> well, lots of people. but uh, It's got nice Colombian blacktails. It, it, it mm. does. And, and Columbia whitetail. But... Um, that, that durability piece, we fall on stuff a lot, and we soak it in water a lot. And yeah. We just have to. It's yeah. part of the lifestyle there. we got a couple other product questions from a couple of people, and maybe you can, uh, we can throw these out to you, Tim. Um, sure. Gail asks, how does the VX Freedom differ from the VX1 and VX2? I think it's a pretty common question, uh, especially when yep. the Freedom is coming out there. So. Yeah, so one of the things that we've, that the main things that we've done is is come back, and, and so you, if you look at our, our lens coating system, we, we try to go through and balance not only the, the coatings themselves, but the optical prescription and, and the contrast and all the things that, that go on inside the scope. So what does all that mean in, in actual English? We've gone back and rebalanced the, the contrast, the resolution, and the glare in our extended twilight lens system. We've done that. We've added some easier to, to turn adjustments on the power selector. Um, one of the one of the things on the the actual physical adjustments for sighting in the elevation and, and the windage are larger, easier to use, um, some things like that. But in general, what you're going to find with the VX Freedom is that it's a, an upgrade, a, a little upgrade even to the VX2. Right. Um, but we've also kind of number of possible options to. Over years, the VX1s and 2s had been in the line, and they'd kept kind of growing and growing and growing. <laughs> and if we're being perfectly honest, it could get confusing. Yeah. Which which one of these do I need? Because there were three. Pick any of them because they'll all work for you. Yeah. Um, we've done a lot of research on that to, to figure out exactly what 
would be best for, for each consumer, and, and, and that's in the Freedom Line. But yeah. short version is um, optical upgrade and, right. and mechanically every bit as sound as the, the Tide uh, Tried and True VX2, um, but at a, at a more reasonable rate in most cases and uh, at an upgraded um, performance level. Okay. And another question we get kind of related to that is, you know, the typical thing where somebody comes in and says, I've got a, you know, 300 wind mag and I want to know what scope I can put on that. That's a broad question that we get quite a bit at a lot of the consumer it, shows. And yeah. You know, yeah. you know what, what I would, would say at that point is, is call Brian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he'll help you. Uh, no, what we do is, is we just need a couple more questions. So, so the main thing when you're trying to figure out which scope you want is how are you going to use it first? So think about what's the lowest power I think I'm going to need. Now, now why, why would you think about that? Why, why would that matter? Well, if you're going to be calling coyotes and, uh, and bobcats in, in the timber, you probably think on on four because I can tell you where that coyote's going to come out, and it's three feet in front of your barrel, and you're never going to see it in the scope because <laughs> yeah, you're right. on 14 power. Um, and then think about what you want on the top end. So what, what type of high magnification do you want? And that, that will get you into the right magnification range. So let's just say a normal 3 to 9 uh, is, is going to work. Then you just kind of look at what levels do you want. Do you mm -hmm. want a CDS dial? Do you want to be able to, to instantly dial it and shoot? And for me, that's where I would start is right at that, roughly at that level, and, and then, okay, do I need the dial, yes or no? If the answer is no, I'm going to sh shoot 200 yards and less. You probably don't need to turn your, mm -hmm. your dial. Zero it and forget it. Make it as simple as possible, right? right. Fewer things to accidentally bump. Right. If you're trying to go farther than that, uh, a CDS dial is a, it's a piece of kit because you tell us what you're shooting, what, what ammo your gun likes, and we match your bullet drop exactly. So now if you need to shoot 300 yards or, or 450 um, you turn it to that mark and hold dead on. Beyond that, you start wondering, okay, um, you know, 3 to 9 or 3 to 18, that's really a question they can only answer right. themselves. Right. You're yeah. getting two scopes, but you're also you're not getting it for the exact same money. So you're, you're mm -hmm. starting to pay for some of that, and you, you just need to see what versatility you, you're after. That's what you're buying in a VX5 or a VX6 HD, uh, 5HD or 6HD. You're paying for basically a, a couple of scopes, in one, and you get this hugely versatile scope that can do any of this. Right. right? You can call coyotes, or you can shoot long range um, and practice out to 12, 1500 yards. Yeah. So. And I think another question that kind of goes along with that is they always wonder about, you know, if this, if the, whatever gun I'm using has, you know, what they consider a high recoil, which scope will survive that recoil in our line? Yeah, it's a fair question. Um, the answer is all of them. And I know that sounds like a, somebody from the factory should tell you that. We test them all exactly the same. So you picture something that's going to live its life on a 50 cal um, and, and be run by our armed forces. Or this new VX Freedom rimfire scope at 179, they, they go through the same recoil testing. Awesome. So um, whether you're putting on a 458 lot or a 22 rimfire, um, 17 HMR, anything in between, um, and even the big heavy boomers that you African rifles, does, they'll take all of it. So. Mm. Good to know. They're all built the same. Well, I think we're kind of nearing the end of our 60-minute uh, uh, session here, so I think uh, we could just getting started. We could talk for a long time about <laughs> a lot of these things. I know, but uh, uh, I think to summarize, you know, it's, as far as trends go, I mean, we talked a little bit about, um, you know, investing in the things that will allow you to stay out there longer. You know, generally speaking, that's that's kind of the the way it's kind of um, I could summarize that. I suppose is is that, you know. What do you need to be able to stay out there longer to be able to pursue, you know, whatever you're after and, and you know, kind of go with, start with that first and foremost. And then, you know, as other needs are, are identified or whatever, everybody's different. And, um, you know, we've got plenty of products, obviously, that will help people, you know, get to their uh, their, their hopeful outcome. But, uh, but, you know, start there with that kind of stuff and, you know, always... I guess keep up with the information that's out there, and you know, listen to people like yourselves, both Randy that's and Brian. That's why we have Randy and Brian. Shameless plug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> shameless. <laughs> Slightly shameless. Yeah. But no, but we. I, I think I Brian would probably agree. We're lucky to get to do what we do. Uh, we come to shows like this. We get. We get to kind of the first glimpse at a lot of products, whether it's in this or archery or whatever, and and. Uh, I don't know that I can call it a job. Can you, Brian? No, it's just life. Yeah. And, you know? uh, yeah. Having, 
having partners like you, like Leupold, that supports who we are, tells us, go do your thing, you've got your audience. We, we are here to support the, what, what that hunting uh, lifestyle is. Mm -hmm. That's really important and helpful for me. Yeah, I feel blessed um, to, to do what I do. I feel an extreme sense of responsibility to give back, yeah. you know. And so getting people into hunting, getting, getting people to, to, to I, I, you said this a long time ago, and it's stuck with me ever since. Um, the more hunters we have, the more people we have that actually value wildlife to the point where they want to put their money back into their time and energy and their money back into to the world we live in, to, in, into the natural world. And I think that that is really, you know, we're losing species by the day, you know, and things like that. This, the conservation piece of what we do is, I think, probably the, leg, the most important legacy we can leave behind. And all of this discussion we, we had today, you know, it's, it's really to that end goal, you know, to, to me is to get people to, to really invest in the future of this planet. And, and hunting is just a, a connection that prov it's that conduit that, that we can, that we give to people that get into it to, to the world around them, gives them the motivation and the, and the actual desire to care about what, you know, the yeah. planet we live on right right so i feel blessed yeah i think we're definitely all lucky you know a lot of people tell us that we're lucky and and yeah. i think we would all agree would that agree we definitely it. are lucky to be in this industry lucky. so uh well i want to thank all three of you you know tim i know you got a really busy schedule during the show here as do does randy and brian but i appreciate you guys uh helping us launch this uh loophole yeah. Core podcast yeah, series great. and uh you know i'm sure we'll have many more planned throughout the show actually this week as well as throughout the rest of the year so thanks a lot for for tuning in everybody and uh we've got more plans so check back to the facebook uh uh page <laughs> to get the uh, the updated schedule on and when our next podcast will be the camera is